My name is Daniel Trinder, and I'm a senior advisor at Four Consulting. And I'll be moderating this panel on central bank digital currencies and the digital euro. This topic really needs little by way of introduction from me. Um, CBDCs is a complex, multidisciplinary topic that needs extensive analysis and debate. But it raises, it raises fundamental questions relating to monetary policy, central bank operations, payment systems, as well as financial stability, um, legal foundations uh, and regulation. Now, I'm sure many people listening uh, will have questions. Uh, if I could ask people just to please hold back uh, on the Q&A function until after each of our panelists has had the opportunity to speak um, first. But let me start by just introducing the panelists. So um, I have um, Ulrich Brinzel, who's Director General, Market Infrastructure and Payments at the European Central Bank. Welcome, Ulrich. Um, I have um, Christina Papakonstini, who, who is um, maybe slightly delayed um, from, from joining us, but Christina is the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Greece. Um, Raphael uh, Orr. Uh, Rafael has just started a new role as head of BIS Innovation Hub at the Eurosystem Centre um, at, at the BIS. Um, Jose Fernandez de Ponta, who's Senior Vice President of Blockchain, Crypto and Digital Currencies at PayPal. And Tobias uh, Tenya, who's Head of Digitalization at the BDB in Germany. So welcome um, uh, all of you. Um, Ulrich, perhaps I can start with you. It, it makes sense given the ECB is pivotal to the um, digital euro debate. And perhaps you can get us up to speed on where we are in the process. Um, maybe also enlighten us as to some of the key design features that need agreement. And also say a few words around the ECB's collaboration with other central, bank, uh, other central banks. So Ulrich, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Uh, and happy to uh, start the discussion. So the yeah, ECB, as uh, was uh, announced, um, started an investigation phase of a digital euro project, which will last uh, two years. We run from October 21 to September 23. And uh, an investigation phase uh, is a well-defined uh, term in uh, ECB projects. So uh, it means basically to prepare everything for the subsequent phase, if uh, then decided to, to go for the subsequent phase, which is the realization phase. So the investigation phase ends with, uh, let's say, a substantial documentation on, uh, on the scope uh, of, uh, of uh, what is to be covered and on uh, the functional requirement, the user requirements. And, uh, and yeah, indeed, first uh, thing to look at is uh, what scope should a digital euro have? What uh, use cases should it uh, cover? And uh, other things in the investigation phase are the general you know, design of the interaction with uh, the European retail payments uh, market, the existing ecosystem. What uh, business model uh, could we uh, design? Um, what uh, features and functionalities should a digital euro have? Example, online, offline. Uh, and what uh, form factor should it have? Should it be only mobile or also cards or other devices? Then there are lots of legal questions. And, uh, and then, for, I mean, the view on a technical solution, what technical solution can address uh, those requirements? And uh, if I can just say a few words on, on some of those aspects. So first, maybe on the use cases. So a lot has been proposed, of course, as a as possible use case. I mean, everything is in theory uh, possible. You could say every, um, every aspect of retail payment could be covered by, um, by CBDC and by Digital Euro. And, and maybe there are two... Um, two main sorts of ideas. One is covering the um, key use uh, cases in domestic retail payments, which you know uh, have really big volume, and that would be uh, POI payments in particular, and, uh, and maybe also P2P payments, and, and all that online. 
and uh, the alternative, an alternative idea would be uh, cover with digital euro those um, use cases that are not covered really now by the industry, because then you are complementary, you know, and, and you cover what is needs to be covered. And, and that could be things like offline payments, uh, programmable machine payments, or cheap uh, cross-border payments. And, uh, and, and the latter you also, you know, when we talk with uh, the industry, often, you know, the industry says, uh, why don't you cover those uh, latter use cases because they are not covered. And, and yeah, it's an understandable uh, point from the industry's perspective. Um, but uh, but then the the argument you know to really think on the first um, set of use cases, the large volume you know existing um, use cases covered by the industry is that those are the ones where we know for sure that uh, there's big demand, that there's techno technology available to do them, and uh, and if you want uh, you know to bring. Uh, a new payment uh, instrument uh, into life, then you know you need to trust also on the network effects. So if you if you try to cover only marginal use cases, probably you know it's not easy to be successful if you are ambitious, and uh, and therefore probably you know you if if you want to deploy and now I'm talking generally on CBDC, if a CBDC is supposed to be successful. It, uh, it first also needs to cover the core um, high volume use cases relevant for everyone as a basis to have uh, network uh, effects and uh, you know be successful in view of the ambition that uh, CBDC should have. Okay, the case of the ECB, all this is being uh, discussed, is uh, not uh, decided, will be decided as one of the earlier key decisions in the investigation phase. Then another interesting fundamental one is a business model. So as, uh, as I don't need to tell anyone in this uh, forum, um, every electronic uh, payment instrument relies uh, on, uh, on the business model, uh, often you know, based on a merchant fee. So what does it mean for CBDC? I mean, how do you transpose uh, this logic to CBDC? question mark. Um, that's a very interesting one. And, um, and of course, here you want to incentivize, encourage the various players in the retail payment industry to actively promote uh, the adoption and use of digital euro through this uh, business model. So yeah, clearly also a question that all central banks designing CBDC have to face. Then uh, one, another interesting one is uh, the following uh, trade-off between various uh, ideas. So one is, of course, you want for cost efficiency reasons, rely on the industry and minimize the investment costs also of the industry for the implementation of a digital euro. At the same time, you want to maintain sufficient independence as an issuer of digital euro you don't want to produce undue dependencies again on the industry or on certain large uh, players in the industry. You also want to, on one side, uh, you know, be efficient and uh, use the, uh, the existing ecosystem. On the other side, you want a distinct value proposition, a, a distinguishability of the digital euro, which, uh, you know, incentivize uh, the consumers to use digital euro and if of course uh, the digital euro is just you know a fully integrated um yeah different uh, form of money within existing uh, you know payment instruments then you could ask uh, why 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 at all um and uh, and yeah at the end you don't want to crowd out private initiatives you want a coexistence somehow so those are all, I would say, interesting uh, trade-offs, or this creates interesting trade-offs, which have to be well understood to draw the right conclusions in the investigation phase. Legal issues, 
Yeah, there are lots of uh, legal issues also. So first is the uh, legal basis, uh, you know, starting from the EU treaty and the ECB uh, statute. So what about an enabling law which would clarify this legal basis? Then a, a fundamental question is a one of a legal tender. Now we have legal tender status for banknotes. What does it mean in the electronic space? Then, um, you know, we have various uh, um, regulations or directives in the space of uh, retail payments. So just to mention AML, CFT, data protection, privacy, inclusiveness, PSD2, SCA. Um, so all, all this, you know, raises the question, how does it, does it apply to digital euro? If you look at the current legal text, is that obvious? And the legislator can ask um, itself, you know, do I want digital euro to be in space, in you know, in scope, or do I want to modify something for digital euro? So that's uh, that's a lot of interesting questions. And here we have a fruitful engagement with the Commission and with the other EU co-legislators to discuss those issues to understand the preferences of the co-legislator to explain uh, the constraints on the side of digital euro for technical and let's say central bank policy reasons and to uh, get here yeah an e efficient sort of coordination with uh, you know each side in its res uh, respective responsibilities understanding the other side moving forward such as to allow the relatively ambitious time table that our decision makers has have uh, hinted at you know they have been speaking about a digital euro or potential issuance in five years so you need to sort out all this also efficiently if you want to uh, keep such a timeline but okay so far we are in, as, as mentioned in a very good dialogue and we we, we you know have no reasons to believe that is not uh, possible yeah so let me let, let me stop there for the moment thank you Daniel Thank you. Thank you, Ulrich. And, and um, as I invite the other speakers, please feel free to comment on anything um, that, that Ulrich said. Um, I don't think Christina is, is yet with us. So, so Raphael, maybe I could turn to, to you. Can, can I, can I um, start with two related questions? Um, and uh, one is around the, the benefits of multilateral cooperation on CBDCs. And how important do you think interoperability is um, uh, around CBDCs. Thanks a lot for for uh, having me here today, and and it's it's great to speak just after Ulrich. Let me let me just uh, note, I'll be speaking on on my own behalf and not of that of the BS, and and I think um, the sort of the, 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 this really touches upon nicely on a lot of issues that Ulrich just mentioned. Uh, what is oh, what is the role of of multi lateral cooperation in CBC. And I think it's really important for two reasons. And the first one is 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 that developing a CBDC is really a learning experience. And 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 together the international community of, of, of central banks can really learn at lightning speeds. So there are 65 CBDC projects around the world. They all differ in their operational architecture a bit, in, in sort of the technological design that is implemented or envisioned. And in the underlying frameworks, like how do people access it? What are the, the economic policies, interest rate, and so forth? And, and Ulrich mentioned there, there are just a very large number of open issues that, for example, the ECB is currently pondering with, but many central banks alike are asking very similar questions. The context always differs a bit as legacy payment systems do and the economic circumstances, but, but there is a lot of learning that, that that can happen and and this happens in on the one side in international fora for example in in the bs hosted committee for payments and markets infrastructure and in an applied context it, it it there are several work streams on this in the bs innovation hub to really foster common policy approaches and and learn from applied experimentation uh, for example um one is is the group of the BIS and seven central banks. The ECB is one part of that, and it, the other central banks are the Fed, the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, the Swiss National Bank, and the Riksbank. And and this group really 
gets together and 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 sort of talks about fundamental issues in CBDC design. So its first report in 2020 uh, laid out sort of the core principles for design. And so, for example, actually Ulrich already mentioned that uh, one, and, and that's really the quintessential one, is to do no harm to wider policy objectives, for example, price or financial stability. Second is, is to ensure coexistence of CBDC with cash and private digital money. And three, to set up CBDC as a, as a means to foster innovation and efficiency. And then this group together, right, has because there, there is a variety of, of approaches, there is a variety of speeds with which different jurisdictions uh, can tackle this issue because some, for example, the Riksbank is, is, right, is, is already in a different situation. It has started that process a bit earlier. Um, and, and so there is this, this, um, uh, this, this mutual learning experience, and, and th that, is, that is still ongoing. The, this group actually has, has published further reports last late year that dug into, into more details, system design and interoperability, user needs and adoption, and financial stability implications. And, and, and so in all this, cooperation is incredibly important in the mutual learning experience for national CBDC development. But there is also the second aspect, and, and I think that's even more important. It's actually here cooperation is quintessential because it's in the area of cross-border payments. Um, those are really, if you compare them to domestic payments, they're really expensive, they're slow, and, and the G G20 called for action to, to make them faster, cheaper, and easier to access. There is an entire roadmap that we've been working on for, for some years now. And, and one sort of, and that's a really a forward looking aspect is of these, these G20 efforts is to harness the potential of CBDCs for cross-border payments. Um, the, the, the sort of the starting argument is, although sort of the intrinsic motive for CBDC development comes um, from, from domestic considerations, it's, this happens in a, in a rather compact time frame in many nations around the world and in a, in a context where low value retail payments are really, really important. And especially, you know, when you compare where today's payment systems, at, at, when they were designed, that was really a different world. Uh, people didn't do e-commerce across borders. Travel was was much lower, and 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 remittances were also at a much lower level. So, sort of the importance of low value cross border retail payments was just not that high. But now it's very different, and and sort of um, central banks can coordinate aspects of CBDC design to foster interoperability. That is something that where the BS Innovation Hub is is really taking an active role, and and we're investigating how multiple CBDCs might be interconnected to form what we call multi-CBDC arrangements. And the goal for these arrangements is really to allow for more or less seamless convertibility of one national and sovereign CBDC into another one. There are various forms this could take. We've sort of, um, uh, we've sketched out three models to sort of, um, as, as, a, as a conceptual framework about of how this could look. Um, so one model would just foster interoperability. It would fo focus on aspects like bringing harmonized messaging standards and encryption standards uh, into CBDC design from the get-go. So to reduce the operational burden of cross-border payments. And the main advantage would really be the clean slate that you now have a situation where a large number of, of, of currency areas are looking into the design of a new payment system and they can coordinate from the get-go. But there could also be more integration. We could, we could have technical or, or market framework interlinkages. So for example, um, one could be interlinking at a technical level where you have two different payment systems but they're interconnected via an interface that allows to process a cross-border payment from one end user to another one across two different currency areas. And you could, 
you know, even have more integration, for example, have a single multi-CBDC system, that is really a system where there is one payment system with one infrastructure and it's operated together by central banks from, from different currency areas and, and that recognize each other's um, uh, identity frameworks. Um, so what one example for, for, for such a project is Project Jura, which is run by, by the BIS Innovation Hub together with the uh, Banque de France and, and the Swiss National Bank. And, and, and this is a wholesale project that, that has sort of in, in, uh, shown how we, we can uh, facilitate cross-border payments and settlements in cross-border set, uh, settings. And, and initiatives like this are really important to scope out sort of the technological par possibilities and, and also sort of to see how they fit into, um, into economic and governance frameworks. And, and, and I just you know, want to conclude by just stating just how important international cooperation is here. We really need to take into account that central banks are really working on a, on a large number of CBDC projects around the world. I think it's 65 uh, as of now. And, and, and we shouldn't take sort of this, the interoperability of these as granted. It's really paramount that we sort of, it bilaterally and in multilateral settings, such as via the BIS Innovation Hub, sort of laying the foundation to sort of tackle problems in cross-border uh, payments by sort of focusing on this aspect from the get-go. I stop here. Okay, thank you. Um, let me turn, um, Jose Fernandez, um, if I could start with some, some private sector view. Given PayPal's sort of global footprint, I wonder if we get your perspective on the, the sort of the global, um, you have 65 projects underway on CBDCs. I, I think what would be interesting is whether PayPal are supportive of the potential rollout of, of these initiatives across the globe, and, and if so, why? Uh, thank you, Daniel. And, and the answer to that is a, is a resounding yes, uh, absolutely. Our vision for the future of financial services is one that is inclusive and accessible, but also more secure and more efficient. And we are seeing in our business in the 200 countries where we operate that like so much of the economy, money and payments uh, have become increasingly digitized. And we only saw an acceleration of this trend. Uh, due to the recent events and the pandemic. We see uh, worldwide the rapid adoption of digital payment solutions as individuals and businesses look for fast and convenient and reliable alternatives to, to cash. Therefore, we are uh, extremely excited about the potential for digital currencies, including central bank digital currencies. We see that the very nature of money itself is changing. And we believe in a world where digital bank, digital central bank money and stable coins coexist with traditional payment instruments uh, to increase choice for consumers and merchants. Many of the re underlying reasons are those that Ulrich and, and Rafael already alluded to, which in the end in our mind go back to uh, increasing the availability of a more efficient and a more resilient payment system. You were saying, do, do we support them? Obviously we are not involved with all 65 uh, projects. We are involved in a number of initiatives where we participate, for instance, in the task forces that the Bank of England and Her Majesty Treasury put together to evaluate the potential for a digital pound. We contribute on the technical side on some of the academic initiatives like the MIT Digital Currency Initiative, and we consult with a number of institutions uh, around the world. Our vision is very much that we want to be a digital wallet for global CBDCs. We sympathize with the recent uh, remarks coming from the, from the Federal Reserve a paper on CBDCs that is supporting a two-tier distribution system. And we think that banks and, and non-bank financial institutions have a role in the distribution of these digital currencies. Thank you. So, so, so with that last comment, uh, Tobias, maybe I can come to you for more of a banking perspective on the, on the, on the introduction of digital euro and the broader um, CBDCs. I was wondering whether banks are worried about potentially being disintermediated as payment providers, um, um, presuming the digital euro gets rolled out. Thanks, Daniel, to uh, having me here. And thanks for all the other speakers uh, for the short position on this one. And uh, this is a quite interesting question because mostly 
the first reaction on banks, if we're talking about CBDC, is uh, they are afraid that any kind of disintermediation engagements happen. But uh, let's start me at first with a core question, uh, and that is why we need this kind of digital money and what problems should solve. And I think that's quite important to come from this side and then to talk about this mediation for banks. Um, from our perspective, we see um, three drivers um, for the future payment ecosystem, um, which uh, also describe the needs of the digital economy. Uh, there's the first, uh, the decline in use of cash that already Joe's uh, described. Uh, so we have a broader use uh, by the uh, customers. We have also uh, more transaction cross-border and cross-border payments with Raphael described. Also, I think it's not a surprise for everybody. And also the uh, COVID pandemic show us that there's a strong need. Uh, the second one is the emergence of new players and competitors, especially global tech companies or coupled with increasing strong competition from China. And you see it in uh, Olympia at the moment the international monetary and technology arenas, which all pose the threat to Europe's digital and monetary sovereignty. And if you look to China, how strong, for example, the digital junk project increased since in the middle of last year. So we had in June uh, 2021, 21 million users. At the end of 21, we have nearly 300 million users in China. That's one third of all that Apple, uh, Alipay at the moment uh, covers. So China, for example, delivers at the moment a really blueprint for CBDC infrastructure, and they're quite advanced because they started in 2015, so seven years ago. Uh, and Ulrich also mentioned a little bit the plan of the ECB and uh, what the roadmap is. So we see that uh, China will develop much more in that area. And uh, if we connect these ideas also with some other uh, initiatives from China, for example, the blockchain service network, um, which was raised in 2020 by China. And initially, we all believe that it's only a domestic initiative for everybody that don't know what is it. It's a kind of uh, interoperability solution between blockchains, low-cost access to blockchain applications, and connect also the digital drum. And not surprised, the government has access to all data and identities. And it's not only domestic market initiative. It's an initiative that also has nodes in France and US and uh, Turkey and uh, South Korea. So imagine in combination with the Asia Trade Agreement, the CBDC in China, the BSC, China could be able to substitute SWIFT, and this world SWIFT as tool for sanction lost completely his effect. So with this aspect, and also what Raphael mentioned regarding the cross-border payment, there's a strong need for sovereignty uh, by Europe. And the last and the third driver, and the, for us personally, the most important one is the digital transformation of the industry. What we see is there, the business processes, uh, the transfer of business processes on the supply chain management, also called as industry 4.0 or the IoT. And this one is currently seeing it's a really extensive automation of processes using this uh, distributed ledger technology and smart contracts. And they have all a core problem, how to proceed payment. So if we come back to your question, uh, if, in, uh, if this intermediation probably could be a problem, then we have to say, do we talk only about retail CBDC or to talk we about a much broader ecosystem uh, that it's needed. And the much broader ecosystem, it's not reflected only by retail CBDC, it's also reflected by wholesale CBDC and by a private solution, uh, we call it a commercial bank money token, which could be based on the blockchain. Um, and if we look back, and the core question, uh, Daniel, to you, um, if probably banks see there any rest of this information, probably a low one, um, it depends uh, if it's more uh, this intermediation that it's connected to a cyclic interest intermediation or structured intermediation. The cyclic one at the moment, I think the most uh, days uh, banks would be not worry about the reduction of the deposits. Um, and if probably the strategy or the interest rate will change from the ECB, I think there's also a low risk of this intermediation on the cyclic side. Structural disintermediation, there is a risk for sure, uh, especially the digital bank run. And we believe that these digital bank runs could ultimately only solve um, with a limit 
um, but it must be a balance because on the other side, the retail CBDC must be also attractive for the consumer. And if you want to buy a used car, for example, uh, you need more than 500 euros or 1,000 euros, wherever the limit is. And finally, the worm must be tasty to the fish and, and not to the fishermen. Thank you, Tobias. I can, I can tell you and your members have thought through this very, very clearly. And I, 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 I think my biggest takeaway from what you said is around the competitiveness with um, some other jurisdictions. Um, Christina, um, thank you very much um, um, for joining. <laughs> we realise you're having a, what, one of those days that, that all of us have from time to time. So, so um, the, the, I, ju I just... Um, We've had initial exchanges, but but I just wonder from a Bank of Greece perspective, if you could pick up, you know, given that you're a member of the uh, Eurosystem of central banks, perhaps you can talk about the collaboration that's going on um, with other central banks um, that Ulrich had also sort of previously just alluded to as well. And I think actually, Christina, just, just one other thing was just, are you, um, relying totally on the ECB analysis uh, around this, or is the Bank of Greece actually also conducting its own analysis to assess the implications? Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, hello, everybody. Sorry for uh, joining you with uh, a bit of delay, so you will excuse me. Now, uh, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned something which is really important in my, in my view, uh, collaboration. So um, I think that um, even on the issue of uh, CBDCs, uh, the need for collaboration and co coordination is there and it, it's valid and I think it's already recognized and uh, you see how this is widely recognized that uh, international fora and with, with initiatives uh, taken at the level of uh, G7, G20, the BIS, they, they, they have all launched uh, um, similar activities and uh, initiatives. And uh, it's, it's exactly this, this uh, um, initiative that can bring together all the experience from uh, domestic uh, explorations uh, and uh, on CBDC. And uh, at the same time, they managed to, to uh, facilitate the collective uh, understanding of, uh, of, of a rather complex, complex issue. Now, um, as far as uh, uh, the, the, the consequences of, uh, of, uh, of collaboration, it's, uh, it's, and it can lead to, to, to an approach that can really managed to identify the core economic and regulatory issues that uh, are common across uh, jurisdictions. And many, many concerns are of a similar nature and uh, uh, international cooperation, it is rather critical in order to build a system for cross-border payments and uh, that will manage to be, to be efficient. Um, I think that um, we, cannot ignore the fact that also CBDC can have, uh, can have a significant international uh, consequences from a macro also point of view and macro financial implications. And um, uh, that would result uh, to, 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 a, to an end where a CBDC introduced by a major economy could increase the international transmission of shocks and exchange uh, uh, rate volatility by influencing, by exactly influencing capital flows. So given the potential for international spillovers of, uh, of, uh, of a digital currency, international cooperation is important in order to take into consideration also the consequences of its use by, by non-residents. And uh, restriction on the use of foreign uh, uh, digital currencies, uh, such as uh, uh, holding or transaction limits, could help it gain adverse global macrofinancial implications. Now, I would say that uh, it is exactly this international collaboration, it should take the form of a multi-dimensional approach similar to what is, has been adopted by, by the Euro system. I'm sure that this has been uh, uh, daily analyzed and, and, and presented before. 
it, it is exactly this approach that allows for various uh, sectors and uh, approaches, various sectors of, of professionals, citizens and, and uh, corporations, uh, self-employed uh, um, persons that would cover all relevant aspects uh, uh, in order to, 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 to build a more inclusive model and uh, therefore increasing effectiveness. At, uh, at the Bank of Greece, uh, we, we do support uh, uh, cooperation and uh, we've seen that we do participate. We have a very active uh, uh, presentation uh, in, um, in uh, let's say, uh, for instance, uh, um, the collective work that it is undertaken by, by the Euro system by, and we participate quite actively in uh, the high level task force and the committees that are currently investig investigating all relevant aspects of, uh, of, the digital, uh, of the digital Euro. I would, um, um, I, I, I would like, with a view to, to, to stress out exactly this importance of collaboration, uh, you will allow me to, to mention two, let's say, uh, initiatives that have been undertaken by the Bank of Greece, and uh, they relate uh, to the, the mere fact that right now we are underway in Greece. Uh, uh, we are, uh, let's say, trying to to pass a digital transformation of, uh, of the economy. So these initiatives relate, first of all, to the creation of a FinTech innovation hub, and then uh, the creation of uh, a regulatory sandbox. Uh, from uh, the observations that uh, we have, uh, let's say, um, seen so far, we, First of all, we noticed that uh, notably 50% of all the queries received by the hub uh, during the latest uh, reporting year had to do with payment and account information services. This exactly, in our view, demonstrates uh, how the payment sector is a focal point of financial innovation in, in, in Greece. And uh, I can mention as an example that only, only recently, two weeks ago, a significant cross-border transaction took place for the acquisition of shares of a dynamic Greek financial um, Greek fintech company. At the same time, we uh, we we uh, have observed that uh, the adoption and the functioning of a regulatory sandbox can be quite uh, quite valuable in understanding how technologies and business models can be tested within a set of control, of control parameters. And uh, this can help uh, all players involved. This can help the fintech companies that are able to test all the innovative solutions and plans that they have in mind. At the same time, it can help authorities to gain a better understanding and a better knowledge of these innovations in order to fully assess both the risks and, and, and benefits. So it is important for regulators to get familiar with those risks as soon as they emerge in order to be, to be able, first of all, to ensure financial stability, but without at the same time uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly stalling innovation. So um, those two points from, uh, from, from my side and- uh, Thank you to continue the discussion with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Once again, sorry for joining you. That's with, okay. Uh, <laughs> we, we understand. <laughs> So, okay, so so thank you everyone. And, and if I could just remind people listening um, to, to ask uh, questions, one's come through, which I'll ask um, um, the panelists in a moment. Um, perhaps I could, before I do so, Raphael, if I could just maybe come back to you now, now that you've heard um, uh, everyone, what are the challenges from this lack of consistency or lack of international consistency that we may get? Um, but particularly, you know, picking up on um, Tobias's point around some of the more advanced uh, countries around some of the work on CBDCs. And what are the design features that we need to get right to minimize these key differences? So, um, yeah, I very much echo uh, both Tobias and, and also Christina's important arguments on sort of the importance of, of, of international cooperation. I think, I think 
the, the, the main challenge is, uh, that's a mental one, is that we should not take sort of interoperability as granted. We, we, we really have a wide variety of models that, that connect to, to different legacy systems that central banks are, are working on. And we really need to also understand sort of the required form of cross-border cooperation to gawk what is sort of politically feasible. So if you want to have just some coordinated design, compatible systems, jurisdictions need to agree on joint standards, coordinate how they develop the infrastructure, how they develop the rule book and the participation criteria. But it's just a coordination of approaches. If, if we have instead some technical interlinkages, so still separate CBDC systems, but, but some bridges between them, um, we, we need to sort of current to together design these bridges, also establish the rules by which they run and, and really run them together. And that already requires much more cooperation. And, and last, of course, if we really go for systems that are really jointly operated, then, then we not only need to design an entire payment systems, we also need to think about how uh, the cross-border transactions are sort of governed in it and how domestic transactions are governed. So, so here I think reaping the benefits of increasingly integrated payment arrangements comes at a cost and 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 people need to be aware of that cost and need to invest in in cooperation and and you know i i just to just to highlight how important that is i i really think we should think about just how difficult it was to converge towards a single pay a standard for payments so iso 2022 which really fitting to its name took about 22 years to be adopted uh, and, and and this is still ongoing and and so really the it there are really low hanging fruits it it's just that these quintessential advantages the clean slate the focus on cross border interoperability has to be has to feature in the international and in the national dialogues from the get go i think this is really the main thing that needs to be overcome Thank you, um, Ul Ulrich. There's a there's a question coming around um, some work of the um, recent paper by the Bank of Canada on monetary sovereignty as, as a rationale. I, I think the uh, the CBDCs and, and and it asks you know participants' views on that. I think the issue is slightly broader than that. Um, you're having you, you you've outlined where the ECB are, ECB are on their process, but I wonder whether there is any conclusions yet to be drawn around the impact on cost availability of credit, financial stability, monetary policy? Um, uh, there may not be political answers, but but I wonder whether or not there's there's any research that maybe you could point people to, um, because I, I think you know in order to get those political answers that, that, that this needs to be grounded in um, you know rock solid analysis. To be honest, on many of these topics. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Daniel. And uh, allow me, uh, if I can, just come back for one second on on cross border. Um, and uh, you know, panels are boring if everybody says the same. So, so let me say something <laughs> slightly different. No, um, no, not slightly different. I mean, I, I agree, of course, with Raphael that in an ideal world there should be very early coordination, and you could do it in one go. And if we can. Uh, Get do something a bit close to this ideal world. It, it it's nice and better, but uh, then we have to really start working on it, and not um, not only talking about it because it's uh, you know it's very substantial, and uh, and my impression is that that you know so far all central banks are very self focused and they have so many you know domestic uh, challenges uh, that um, you know effectively discussing at the same time. To do similar things uh, like others uh, to move in parallel or to move not in parallel but to um, you know to end in a state where you have uh, you know you are prepared for immediate interoperability at least it will not be easy no then it has I mean it has to be taken then seriously and to be seen how, how this really works an alternative is to say okay let's go for it it's accepted that uh, the main challenge is to deploy it as a now a successful domestic POI scheme as a first step and P2P 
And this is already, you know, having huge questions, which all need still to be answered. And, uh, and then a bit um, like in the case of uh, Nexus, which is also a BIS uh, project, that uh, you then, you know, interlink, you know, you accept they are different, but then you build, a, uh, you build the interlinking engines and maybe at the end this is more realistic, but uh, okay, Raphael is well aware, of course, of, uh, of all the trade-offs and has uh, written about it. But uh, I'm not sure if we really will not end in the latter. And I wouldn't say that this is uh, very bad necessarily, because if you have, uh, you know, starting with a few, or, or, or even then, you know, you can go for a common approach like, like Nexus, you know, you could then think, you know, what can we do as common components? Where do we need to translate? At the end, you need addressable CBDC addresses, you know, and then you need a, a, a cross-currency conversion engine organized competitively like outlined in, in uh, Nexus. So that is also not uh, absolutely infeasible. But of course, the, the other approach in theory is much better, no, no question. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then, of course, let's not forget that uh, cross-border payments suffer from many things which will not be solved by CBDC per se, no? Um, I mean, we have uh, Jose here, so PayPal has uh, a great uh, international reach, you know, fantastic uh, basis for doing cross-border payments within its network. But uh, PayPal has not been extremely aggressive, you know, in offering very cheap cross-border payments. And there are various good reasons for that. Um, and uh, those, those reasons, you know, would also apply to CBDC. They all need to be solved. And first, first of all, of course, um, compliance issues. And again, Nexus has uh, identified those and uh, one needs to work on them anyway. And, but then now back to your question, and I have to be short now. The, um, the, let's say, financial stability and the uh, avoidance of, uh, let's say, bank disintermediation and preservation of uh, monetary policy. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, taking the case of the euro area where interest rates uh, have been uh, deliberately pushed into negative territory for risk-free um, assets, there cannot be unlimited zero remunerated CBDC. That's very easy to conclude then uh, or, or you would undermine immediately the monetary policy stance and have large disintermediation. So not possible. So the main options in my view are then the limits or tiered remuneration. And, and I'm uh, personally an advocate of tiered remuneration. Also in view of if you want, you know, to be open and have re this being eventually a retail instrument in the wide sense, so also for all uh, non-financial corporates as uh, what is close to the heart of Tobias, of course, then you cannot, you know, work with limits and design limits for corporates and so on. Then just acknowledge that because of monetary policy, you cannot uh, price CBDC in a way to make it an attractive investment. Price it's, you know, just below that it's not attractive as large scale investment. And that's not a problem, you know, for also corporate usages. I mean, it's, it's just an incentive to not sit on a l large stock of money permanently. But for me, this is the most, uh, you know, efficient and, uh, and easy to implement uh, option. And uh, okay, but limits would also be a possibility. So there are effective safeguards. And in the case of DCB, no doubt that this, uh, those will be needed. And in the investigation phase, we don't need to say, that we need a limit for 3,000 euro. We just need to say what are the, um, the, you know, the features we need to build into digital euro. And then in, f in five years or whatever years, our decision makers at that time can decide on the basis of the environment then prevailing, whether they believe they need a limit or if they want tiering and what the size is and, and, and all that, yeah. I think that's that's just, that is feasible, and it, for now in the investigation phase, we just need, in my view, to build in several of those safeguards. Later on, we will see how to specify them and use them. Um, and maybe more tricky than 
and, and, and that also protects banks. And I mean, if we look uh, again, you know, just we have now um, banknotes in circulation of 1.5 trillion, of course, incentivized also by the zero remuneration and the low interest rate environment, which uh, which will not be there forever. So the trend of banknote, I think, increase will not go on forever, also because of less usage. Then uh, there is uh, some space in the balance sheet to have a CBDC and and you know even big amounts from a perspective of the payments uh, usage uh, can can be allowed without uh, causing disintermediation. In particular, if you look at our balance sheet today, which has such a huge excess liquidity, which could then be also absorbed to some extent uh, by CBDC without you know harming the banking system at all. Thank you. There's a question come in reacting to Christina's um, comments on the Bank of Greece and their regulatory sandbox. And, and I, but I think it's a, it's a broader question maybe um, that, that I'd ask you know, any of the participants. So the question's coming from Paul Worthington. To, to, uh, to that end, do regulatory sandboxes have a future to play in testing and rolling out a potential digital euro? Would anyone like to react to that question? Sorry, uh, can, can you just repeat because I, I misheard you. Can yeah, you so it's, yes, Sorry. yeah, so so it, it's the, um, uh, Christine, it's on the back of what you said about regulatory sandboxes um, and helping innovation in the payment sector. And, and so the question is slightly broader than that. It's just the extent to which regulatory sandboxes have a future role to play in the testing and rolling out of a potential digital euro. From my side, if I can just add a small comment, uh, I mean, this experience so far with the use of this, uh, of this uh, tool uh, has been uh, uh, quite uh, uh, useful and uh, led us uh, to some initial uh, conclusions that can be really helpful. So yes, it is a, protect, a protected regulatory environment that uh, gives the opportunity to uh, regulated companies to test their ideas. The sandbox right now, it's, uh, it's limited only to supervised uh, financial, uh, financial entities. Uh, we have um, a rather recent experience. Actually, it was launched uh, in, in June 2021. So with, uh, let's say, the, the outcome of the experience of the last seven months, uh, we have observed the interest. We have, uh, it gives uh, the, the, the provision of, if you want a protected environment, uh, um, gives uh, the, the space for uh, uh, companies uh, that uh, want to test their innovative ideas uh, to have a forum to, forum to do that. So, so far, the, the uh, conclusions are rather positive from our side. So yes, from our point of view and from uh, the experience, uh, it, is, it is a very useful tool. Thank you. Jose Fernandez, if I can maybe come to you. Um, you, you alluded to the work of the, the Fed when you spoke earlier. Um, there's, there's a consultation by the, the Fed, for those that don't know, on CBDCs last month. And, Having looked at some of it, I was struck by the emphasis the Fed placed on giving entrepreneurs a platform on which to create new financial products and services. So any comments you have around the Fed's work on this? But, but, and then and another question which you know, brings me to one of the, the questions we've had, which was that given you started to introduce wallets for CBCDs, in any jurisdictions, just your emerging views around that. And, and the, the, the question that was asked earlier was around the platform in the, the, the Caribbean that's gone down. Um, so, so any comments around that? And Raphael, um, uh, likewise, would be useful to get your, your take on that. Eva, you wanna start? Yep, yeah, I can start and, and uh, happy to do that. I, the Fed paper that came out a couple of weeks ago is, is extremely interesting, albeit it is, is high level and is more about the state of the question and, 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 and the question that, that need to be addressed. 
I think that there are two very significant contributions that, that the paper and, and the initiative around the Fed have made. The first one is a, on a strong statement in favor of a tier distribution system. So part of the question that has been debated in different projects is uh, the role of, of the central bank uh, as a provider of the service to retail users. Uh, there's been a ton of debate, as I'm sure that the panel and, and the audience is familiar with in the US about whether that is something that actually the Federal Reserve would be allowed to do under existing regulations in the US. The paper from, from, the, from the Fed strongly supports a tier distribution system where the central bank would be the issuer of the CBDC, but distribution would be for uh, regulated finance institutions, both banks and, and payments companies. And, and, and that is an important uh, statement they made. The other is, as you were saying, is, is the support of this idea of of a CBDC as a platform for innovation, meaning that the private sector will build on, on top of that. And maybe it relates to the prior question that we were discussing on sandboxes and how is best, what is the best to provide a safe space for innovation from the private sector around CBDCs? I think the sandboxes are definitely, uh, can, can be a, one aspect of that. The other, uh, which has been very interesting to follow is at which moment there is actually a construct that is not theoretical that the private sector parties can start to interact with and contribute. And the example that the Fed used shortly after they published their paper, they also released the code of what is being called Project Hamilton, which is the collaboration between the Boston Federal Reserve and, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which provides probably for the first time that I've seen an open source code base from a central bank that is open to contribution from external engineers. It is definitely not a blueprint for a full-blown CBDC, it's just one piece of the equation, but it provides uh, an environment in which engineers from my team can start to look at code repositories and actually start to tinker with the code and, and provide recommendations that go beyond uh, the theoretical construct. Because when you look at some of the thorny issues that have to be addressed by a CBDC, that the steam panelists have been uh, highlighting things like throughput and latency and resiliency, resiliency of the system. They are really, really difficult to, to materialize until you are able to have them be more tangible. So both the regulatory safe space to experiment around it that could be provided by a sandbox or a similar construct, but also some tangible platform where even if it is just a small part of the, of the whole construct, but you can use to road test and kick the tires of the, of the idea. I think there have been valuable contributions from, from that approach. Rafael, I, I, I know that you were also going to add to, to, to that answer. Thanks. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to go specifically to the question on cyber resilience. And I think that's a very important point. And, 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 and you know, I, I think that episode of, of, of a CBDC having an outage should be taken importantly against the backdrop that resilience of the retail payment system should be for central banks a key aspect of the design um, and we have to see it in the context of cash being used less and less and we have to imagine just how much havoc uh, a cyber like a, an outage or a successful cyber attack would have in an economy that can no longer effectively rely on cash and and given that cash is being used less and less cbdc should really have this as a main focus in mind and and that's why also why the bis innovation hub has launched a project exactly on that on resilient cbdc design with an eye on offline payments that is really a project that the the nordic hub has has started and that is 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 uh, I, th I think very vital for for this debate and i think this episode is sort of um, you know is, is is something that we, we should keep an eye on and and really think about why are we develop what are the use cases and what is the engineering focus that we should have thank you i, I agree totally i i think the, the broader context as well around that is is uh, incredibly important um um, to, Tobias, if I could um, just just come back to you on the the banking side, I think I think you you gave a very good sort of overview um, of, of some of the issues. 
around potential benefits um, or, or design issues. Um, but, but the and again, I'm focusing on the banking industry. I mean, one of the 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 issues would be um, if you look at the capital that the banks currently hold in Europe. Um, that's largely deposits from customers, and, and really, you know, and th this is something that some of the the banking analysts have been starting to focus on. Is there a risk with the CBDC world that that customers won't hold their deposits in banks, and therefore, you know, apart from the payments issue, there's a there's a knock on implication for the cost of capital for many banks. Thanks, thanks, uh, Danny, for, for this question because it's related to one aspect and, and before probably I want to, to come back to two aspects uh, that Ulrich as well as Raphael uh, mentioned. Um, I think the risk, and that's what I mentioned as this mediation already, uh, is already in place. So for, for sure that one, uh, so there is a risk uh, that um, uh, probably private households uh, could not anymore hold the deposits on the banking side and would probably uh, uh, transfer the money to the CBDC side. So when uh, the question, if there is any kind of this risk and that's called the structure, this intermediation, um, is it a place if we probably have any kind of financial distress situation. Um, Ulrich mentioned that he sees the remuneration as a proper approach uh, to avoid any kind of this disintermediation. Um, and I'm a little bit afraid and to combinate, combinate also with what Raphael mentioned regarding uh, the resign resilient. Um, if you have a blockout uh, anymore, so there is uh, no chance to limit the account on, on the retail CBDC in that case, and, and probably everybody knows the book that uh, is pub was published uh, 10 years ago, and that we see in the last 24 months that much more often uh, in Germany, we had some smaller blockouts in some smaller regions. Uh, so the risk is really increasing, and we know also that uh, this um, aspect of any kind of block blockout, blockouts was also one of the driver for the Riks Bank. Uh, to think about uh, uh, to implement a CBDC or to issue a CBDC. Um, and for this reason, the risk, yes, uh, is in place for sure. Uh, um, and that's also one of the most critical aspects from our perspective, uh, why it makes much of sense to take the time to analyze deeply if and how retail CBDC uh, should be implemented. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think that remuneration is the right right way, uh, as I mentioned already, because of the of the resigning. Uh, but uh, probably, Daniel, I, I could add one other question that uh, all the time is running in my my uh, in my thoughts, uh, because we talk about uh, collaboration, we talk about cross border, um, and there is, from my perspective, perspective. Uh, wholesale CBDC, one kind of CBDC that's much closer and where what we really need because uh, we have already uh, 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 digital assets on the blockchain, uh, we can trade and settle uh, bonds, for example, DLT based. So we have an asset like right uh, from based on the technology point of view, but we have no cash like you can't use any kind of CBDC for this transaction. And that's really quite interesting if we want to reduce counterpart risk. Because Tina also spoke about uh, financial market stability. Uh, uh, Daniel, you also talk about, to Jose, about the cross-border border, uh, uh, transfer. I'm not sure if I, I want to do it using PayPal uh, or if I want to use a European uh, uh, provider for, for such a kind of um, transactions. Um, and from my perspective, it would be interesting to understand why we not also asking and discussing about wholesale CBDC because the regulatory framework for the asset lake is a place, but we have no CBDC on the chain at the moment, and that would be much more urgent uh, as a retail CBDC. So, so maybe on that, Ulrich, just on that last part of the wholesale, I mean, I think there's a broader issue, and, and I think you alluded to it talking about the legislation that would need to potentially uh, change in Europe. Um, I think the issue really is how does this affect the kind of financial market infrastructure? And we are seeing, as Tobias has said, the, the growth of digital assets in, in the wholesale markets. 
um, uh, you know, albeit with um, private sector initiatives or, uh, or, or currencies. Um, so, so, so really, it's just how how you how how the ECB are really thinking around financial sector financial sector market infrastructure type issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no good to touch on this. Uh, so wholesale CBDC we have right. Uh, we have um, in in Europe uh, target. We have T2S. This is central bank digital currency, and also uh, used for security settlement. So the term wholesale CBDC is is used in my view um, wrongly, um, because what what people mean is a sort of um, whatever you know tokenization is also a very vague term but let's call it the tokenization of uh, central bank money available to banks which would then allow you know kind of advantages like bottom up uh, programmability um, you know 24/7 all sorts of things um, you know integration into blockchains with uh, on, with uh, securities and uh, atomic sediment and, and, and all this uh, sort of things. So that's also interesting and we look at it. Uh, we we try to not uh, mix it with uh, retail CBDC. I, I would define retail CBDC in the broad, I mean the term retail in the sense of including all non-banks. So also, you know, corporate usage and so on. And at least in the long term, uh, maybe not in the first release uh, of a CBDC, but eventually. And on wholesale, yeah, I mean, wholesale is also interesting to look for new forms of wholesale CBDC to really understand what uh, technologies um, make sense for a central bank. I mean, the whole, of course, tokenization, DLT comes, you know, D, D stands for distributed. Um, it comes from the side of uh, this, the idea of decentralized finance um, with, uh, let's say, peers, uh, equal peers, you know, running a blockchain, <laughs> validating a blockchain. And, and we come from the side of C, C like central banking. And, you know, then bring how to bring those two uh, uh, worlds together, uh, where is really the value added, what makes a difference. And we should be uh, open minded to, to this, certainly. And, and study and understand and it's then a matter of the long-term evolution you know if you want of uh, the current wholesale CBDC universe that exists. Thank you. Um, we, we have a, a, a few minutes left so, so what I thought I would do is, is give everybody the opportunity just to um, if there's anything they haven't raised or react to any of the comments but I've got one, one question I'd like each of you to ponder possibly answer uh, if, if and that's and that's the following um and we'll we'll, we'll go in the um, reverse order that i asked um you to speak in L last summer the financial times ran the headline cbdc's now seem a matter of when not if and i wondered whether each of you um agree or disagree with that statement um, so I'm going to go to Tobias first of all. So, so you know, feel free to comment on anything that, that hasn't been raised, but but also on that question. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Daniel. And I think uh, this question was raised uh, on the last uh, nearly three years quite often. Um, if we had a look back and if we also sort of start this discussion, I think runs not only by by the initiatives from China, also start by the initiatives in, in 2019 from from Facebook initially Libra. So we know already that's not anymore, <laughs> not anymore a place. Um, so um, what I see in that that round and also to this question was really many interesting perspectives on CBDC and totally I'm um, clear. Um, I think. Uh, the question is not if the question is when. Uh, for the banking perspective, um, to be partner also in, in this process um, and to support this time when CBC could be issued, we want to get more transparency about the current process. That's our way really, really challenge that we see. We want to get more integrated as bank in this process to have more discussions um, uh, with all partners. Um, and the focus should be to build the infrastructure uh, um, and the open-minded, all excited, open-minded approach. That's really, really uh, interesting. 
Um, and this infrastructure should be really infrastructure and less a payment scheme and parallel to the current offerings by European banks. Um, because we're a little bit afraid that probably some approaches that are uh, aimed by the discussion that we saw in the last months or is a little more closer to instant payment or, or tips. And we wish that uh, the ECB and that way uh, would sum up the courage to create a really innovative and competitive infrastructure for the future of Europe. Um, and uh, because uh, we can do that only once uh, and uh, we are in the starting blocks to support an innovative approach uh, and also um, the time and starting point. Thank you. Jose Fernandez. Thanks, Daniel. If or, or when, uh, maybe the, the if is a little bit, is kind of a, of a moot question in the sense that there are CBDCs out there today, right? It is not only a number of projects, but China is live. There are a number of countries in, in, in the Caribbean and some other places where the concept of a CBDC is, is live already. Will we see some of the initiatives in, in, all, in all countries happen in the, in the short term? I think that, that that is a valid if. I, what I do believe is that we will see some of the CBDCs that are out there will continue to grow. I think that we will see a more immune institutions or private stable coins and the private sector will, will have a, a store value type of instruments. And I think that the, the in the sense of when do we will we see a digital euro or dollar or pound? I think that there are very valid conversations that are going on. The, the UK recently was publishing, a, I think it was the UK Parliament saying hey, we don't really see a use for a retail CBDC a, in the UK. So I think that the debate, I, I wouldn't say that is by all means certain that that all the largest economies will be issuing a, a CBDC. We think that is fundamental value in, in that. But these things need to be done carefully and need to proceed at the right uh, speed. So I, maybe it's not a when, but it's on how fast. And I think that, that we are still at the very be at the beginning of that process. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the UK side, it was the House of Lords uh, committee, but you, you, it's a good point. Thank you. Um, Raphael, please I turn to you now. So, so I think, so I certainly agree with what has just been said. But I think you know we shouldn't be focusing too much on the if or when. I should be. We should be focusing as central bankers on the what, and and what is the use case? Or I mean, there could be multiple ones, and it could be a wholesale one. Where certainly I agree with Ulrich that wholesale CBDC has been around for quite some time, but we're we're talking about novel conditionalities in payments essentially. Um, uh, or it could have a use in cross-border payments. That could be wholesale. That could be retail. Or it could be a resilient backup retail option that's actually, it's not used much, but it's usable in case other systems have an outage and it could be usable in a retail context. And I think for central banks, you know, the if, the what, uh, the, the, the if, the, and the when, that, that is a larger political debate often. And central banks should really focus on the what, what is, if others decide to go ahead, what is the best product I can deliver? What are the use cases and what is the technology to make it better? And I think that is really, that is the one thing that I want to emphasize in this. Thank you very much. Uh, Christina, please. Sorry. Well, uh, it's, uh, I mean, a series of questions. If, when, what? I think uh, it's, it is exactly the uh, the answer to this question that uh, has uh, has uh, led uh, at least the euro system to go into investigating what uh, uh, can happen and how the idea of uh, of uh, let's say uh, adopting it and uh, pursuing a digital euro project. Uh, uh, has um, has been decided. So I think that the use of uh, new innovative forms of uh, of currency, as uh, as we all agree, is 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 part of the current uh, almost uh, universal focus on the digital transformation of the payment sector, and uh, that also implies uh, answers to 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 the question that you raised. Um, the 
it's it's important to to notice that uh, the public consultation that uh, the euro system launched uh, uh, in 2020, in the context of the Digital Euro Project, um, aiming at collecting answers from users and, uh, and uh, uh, including private citizens, corporates, and, uh, and uh, uh, specialists in the areas of financial services and payments, uh, showed uh, exactly how important it is not to forget uh, that um, any, any digital currencies, uh, including the digital euro project, uh, needs to bear in mind that uh, citizens are the end users. So things uh, that um, uh, relate to broad adoption by them is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is an important prerequisite for any kind of uh, efficient and effective uh, digital currency. So uh, let's, uh, let's see at the level, maybe Ulrich can, can provide more answers <laughs> on that. But uh, I think that um, being in, an, in uh, an investigation phase uh, at the level of the Euro system, uh, I think that we should all be looking forward to, to, to the results of, of this exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, with that, Ulrich, please, the, the last yeah. comments. Yeah, Christina gave the correct, um, I mean, official answer. The governing council will, will decide at various stages first to go to a realization phase, yes or no, and then to issue yes or no. But um, my personal view on your initial question, is it if or when? I think it is when and what, of course, um, Raphael is right. And uh, yeah, it's just, I think, not, uh, not thinkable that central banks will just uh, stick to 17th century technology you know, paper financial instruments have uh, disappeared in most areas. And, you know, if you extrapolate the technological progress, you know, the progress we can have on electronic identity and mobile devices will further improve um, biometrics. All those things, you know, speak so, so strongly in favor of a continuation of the trend of relative attractiveness of electronic payments. And you could say, you know, those who say we don't need CBDC are conservatives, but in fact, they are maybe the revolutionaries because they want to transform the, you know, system we had for two centuries now with the coexistence of uh, private and public means of payment, also for non-banks, for citizens and, and non-bank uh, firms. I mean, that they want to discontinue basically to stick with the 17th century technology in central banking, that uh, that is very revolutionary and that will not uh, be, I think, sustainable. Thank you very much. So, so um, uh, Ulrich, Christina, Rafael, Jose Fernandez and Tobias, thank you very much for a great panel. Um, it's been very easy to moderate with you because you've all been so insightful on what you said. And so thank you for sharing your views uh, with us today on CBDCs.